Sandry with Monster Creek Mushrooms. A little bit out of breath from uh, carrying stuff up and down stairs, including the pressure cooker down full of hot agar. So today, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about agar work and a few little tips and tricks that I've got for it and just kind of the standard practice. So let's get to that. So this is what I use to hold my centrifuge tubes for pouring agar and to store them until they're ready to go in the refrigerator. Uh, this glass right here was just put in to help weigh down and create a temperature buffer for my Erlmeyer flasks. So we pull that out very carefully. It, everything in here is still piping hot. All right, so these tend to be very, very hot. And again, I have another jar in here uh, to buffer the temperature. I try to put as much water in here as possible, but if you put so much water in here that your oil water flasks start to float and fall over, um, it helps to put jars of water because they can be standing columns of water that will help buffer the temperature. That way when this thing cools down, especially in front of the fan, the glassware won't crack. I've had that happen before. And you do not want a hot agar mess from a dirty, uh, dirty little crack showing up. So, I just place everything else back in the pressure cooker. And I close it back up. Usually because the things are still hot, this comes back up. I just put the weight on there. So it's all in one unit again and ready to use again. Remember, these things are very hot. It's a little burn in my hand. I want to talk to you guys a moment, for a moment just about the Erlmeyer flask. Um, I have seen a lot of people getting on YouTube and other places and talking about they're using these pitchers. It obviously works for them, so you know if, if that's one, one of your things is that you like to use those uh, polypropylene uh, pitchers, go ahead. You know, it works for lots of people. I'm just not that way. I don't like it. The big reason that a lot of people say it is because it's made to pour. <clears throat> if you don't realize that this is made to pour things, I, I don't know what to tell you. It, it, it's not just, an Erlmeyer flask isn't just made to pour, you know? That's the biggest thing with it is that <clears throat> it is made to be, to pour. It is made with a narrow, narrow, narrower, wow, that's a hard word to say. It is made with a narrower, Dang the rhotic dialect of the Scots Irish, huh? Narrower <laughs> opening. It is made with a narrower opening. There we go. That'll work. So one of the reasons for that uh, is it's kind of twofold, but the, the main reason is it reduces the amount of area in which germs can fall back in. And so we're doing our work in a flow hood. Lots of labs don't use flow hoods. They actually do open air transfers near Bunsen burners and things like that. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go look up uh, brewing and culture slant videos. You'll see a lot of open air stuff. They'll be working near the mouth of the flame, passing tools through, uh, doing that kind of stuff. And the narrower opening allows for you to work in a less than ideal space uh, and reduce your chances of contamination. So, that said, there's another cool little thing about the Erlmeyer flask. When it goes up and goes to the edges, the rim around the mouth of the opening, it has a little drip loop. Um, just a little little way that hangs off. And that is so that whenever you're pouring, you can pour and twist. Right? So I'm pouring and I twist as I'm coming back up. That allows me to reduce spill. I don't want a bunch of agar spilling all over my table. Occasionally it still happens because as the agar cools, it'll drip, it'll hang on easier and drip. So as I'm getting closer to the bottom, you know? Um, <clears throat> but, I mean, that's what that's there for. It's there for pouring so you don't make a mess. It's deep, made to deal with uh, chemicals and, you know, the uh, the agar that we're messing with. Now, another reason why I like an Erlmeyer flask over a pitcher. See this right here? The shape, the shape is perfect for this motion. So now I can pour a dish, swirl it. Why do I need to do that? Well, for most agar work, you're not going to. But I put sawdust and soy pellets in my agar mix. And uh, whenever I do that, they settle to the bottom. If I don't have a good way of just stirring, 
it's gonna all settle until the very end, whenever I'm really upending everything. So my first few dishes are gonna have no sawdust and soy in them, or very little. Now they'll have sawdust and soy broth, you know, where it was cooked, but they're not gonna have the solids. The last dishes will be thick with solids. I put, um, and I'll go over recipes on agar here in a moment, how to make your agar up. Uh, for now, I wanna show you how to pour and work with it, and then we'll get into how to make it. But I use a gram each of sawdust pellet and soybean hull pellet in each one of my 500 milliliters of agar. So there are solids in there. The reason why I use that much um, is because those solids, when properly stirred and poured, you can still see through the dish. To give an example, here is an example of that kind of dish. And you see how you can still see through it. You can still see that growth from the bottom side. I, oh, sorry guys. I like to be able to look through the bottom because that protects you from, you know, if you can see bacteria or anything else growing underneath the, the mycelium. So it allows me to hold my dishes up to a light and then inspect them for any bacteria underneath. Let me show you a bacterial dish. This is a wild clone that I captured at a place called Panther Creek. Um, now, let's look at, my gosh guys, I'm sorry. This tripod is kinda all over the place. It's right here. Now this was a red dish, and the mycelium has eaten the color. But I don't know if you can see these kinda yellowish patches. See, that's where I took a chunk out. But there are these yellowish, pat yellowish patches, and then there are clear patches. And those more clear patches are actually where the mycelium is. The yellowish patches are where the, um, actually, let's zoom in just so you get a really good look. There you go. That yellowish patch is yeast. And yeast is a big deal in mushroom cultivation. It will outcompete and eat up your mycelium really quickly. And we're gonna talk about agar cleanup in this as well. And we'll talk a little bit. How you doing, boy? Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, cleanup work after we get done talking about how to make the agar. All right, so when it comes to Petri dishes, I buy mine uh, by the box of 500. Um, but you can get them in sleeves of 20 or 25, depending. Uh, this is a, a sleeve of 25. Now, pouring dishes is very straightforward, very simple. I've actually covered it in a video before, but this agar work video will be a lot easier to go over. Um, there are plenty of different places to buy dishes. I bought these uh, from a local company called Everything Mushrooms. Um, these are not bought by the 500. In fact, you can see my price tag right there. Um, I ran out of Petri dishes, so I bought two sleeves from them to do this video while I'm waiting on my case of 500 to come in from the lab supplier. Uh, that said, I'll put a link down below where you can where you can buy some dishes. So, just alcohol the outside down. Sanitize my scissors. Find the bottom dish, which is right here, and it's gonna be kind of hard because I'm not left-handed. Um, I always cut just below that seal where the impulse sealer seal it and uh, flip my bag upside down. Now this will be important. Don't throw your bag away if you're watching this and following along. So don't throw away your bag yet. I hold the top of my dishes like so. I basically put my hands like this around the plastic and then I just pull up holding the dishes down. I take my open side of my bag and place it right there facing the, uh, the flow hood. I then take my dishes and I take them off in stacks of five. Now I should have five stacks of five. 
I inspect for any broken dishes. I didn't see any. So, just put that bag right there where it's in the clean airflow. Grab one of my Erlmeyer flasks and give it a little, a little swirl. You don't want to give it a real hard twirl because you'll get bubbles on the top. And those bubbles will be poured into here and then it'll, the, your agar will cool with bubbles in it. And that's not really a problem. In fact, sometimes I do that on purpose to uh, put what might be a dirty piece of tissue in there and then the aerial mycelium can leap over and the uh, bacteria have to grow in the bubble, up the bubble and around before they get out. We'll go over all that later. Sanitize. My, uh, I actually don't want to sanitize my dishes. I accidentally sprayed them a little bit. I take my uh, foil off and then let me just adjust the camera here so you can see this a little bit easier. Let me sanitize my hands. I take my polyfill and I'm not talking towards this at all. From this point on I'm talking over here towards you. I take this and give it a quick spin while dragging it across the top of my Omar flask without touching it. And what that does is keeps any of these stray fibers from sticking, giving a place for agar to cool and creating a big mess. You don't know if you're ever going to need these back for some reason if you stop to talk to somebody or whatever. So I set it in the clean flow until I'm done pouring these dishes. This should be right about 500 milliliters. And I can see that it is so I didn't have any boil off. And we'll just give it a quick little tw twirl and pour five dishes out real quick. people complain about their hands getting hot. If you time this right or double up your gloves, it's not really hot. Really hope I did all that correctly. I could barely see. For one thing, I was looking at the camera while trying to pour to see if I was getting you guys a good shot. Couldn't really see that and couldn't see past my own hand where I'm trying to keep my hand out of your, your vision. So I'm hoping that all that went through correctly. If I'd been paying better attention, I would have poured these a little bit better. As you can see, I'm actually getting low on agar. Normally, 500 milliliters is enough for me to do 25 dishes. But you guys can see where I actually did end up making a little bit of a mess <laughs> where I was uh, trying to show you guys and couldn't pay attention to the five things at one time. So, uh, anyways. Let's get the rest of it. We got five more dishes to pour on this one, one more sleeve to go, and then we've got our culture tubes we're gonna we're gonna do. mushrooms if you're watching this I really don't like these labels on the sides of these bags So, 
sometimes I'll just let these I'll, I'll sit, let them sit in front of the fan and cool for about an hour and then I will come back and bag them up for storage uh, until I need them later. However, um, tonight I've got a family dinner I'm going to with my Nana and the rest of the family, so the big plan. Uh, so I'm going to bag these with the bags that they originally came in, that's why we put them right there in front of the uh, flow hood, and we're going to let them cool in a protected space. And when I come back home, they'll be nice and cool, they won't be dried out, uh, they could have sit in front of the fan for hours, and then I'll just simply turn them on their side and seal that bag back up with my uh, impulse sealer. So, bag goes up. Alright, so this is one of the clumsiest parts of the process. I suck at this. So, watch me and elate in my poor handling of this. See? Told you I suck. Hold on one second. alcohol and use a paper towel to clean it up. So I've got agar cooling, so I'll make this quick because I don't want it to cool so much that I can't pour it in my tubes. These are centrifuge tubes. I buy them pre-sterilized off of Amazon. I'll put the link down below, or Robin will, uh, and you guys can go buy them. I buy them by, I think it's a 500 case, and uh, this is what I use to store my cultures in long term. We'll pour it in here, put it at an angle so that the agar will cool at an angle. Um, it will have sawdust and soybean in it, um, soy bean hole, I mean, and uh, I mean just a little bit of the Masters Mix pellets from the uh, agar mix. And uh, yeah, guys, I mean that's that's pretty much it. So I've got to get some of the prop this thing up on, and then we'll be we'll be good to go. Well, I couldn't find my normal stand, but we'll just use my parafilm dispenser because it's clean. There that goes, and now I'll have my tube sitting right here, I'll pick one up, pour it, and then set it in here to cool. Alright guys, so I've got 500 milliliters of agar solution in there, in my Erlmeyer flask, and that's enough to do about 20 milliliters into 25 of these. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. Each one I'll fill up to right between the 15 and the 20 milliliter line. I'll take this. Usually I hold my cap like that face the numbers towards me and then just pour close 
close it up all the way, set it in. And guys, a little tip that you uh, may not know that I've learned very recently is, I like to get mine where it's angled, see how that's angled like that, on the white. Then I can put my label there uh, after I label these things, after they've been inoculated, and I will still have the clearest view possible of my uh, mycelium growing. So, now that we're done with the pour, um, let's talk about the usefulness of each one of these uh, containers we just used. Okay, so the Petri dish is a great wide surface so that you've got plenty of surface area for mycelium to grow across. As it grows across, you're able to take a chunk from anywhere that's clean. Um, which is another example of why petri dishes are good. You can see contamination growing on them easily. Um, and you can sector out, you know, by taking a, a, cutting out a small chunk uh, in your flow hood and transferring it to another petri dish where it can grow or to a jar of grain or a bag of grain or anything else that you need. So it's good for replication, good for cleaning work. I don't like petri dishes for long-term storage. You can use them for long-term storage, and I used to, but that's how I almost lost a couple of strains. The parafilm on the sides, even though they were in plastic baggies, uh, the parafilm on the sides dried out and shrank until there were holes in it, and mold was in every single culture that I tried to pull. So I actually thought that I had lost my NNG oyster, um, but the NNG oyster was saved uh, due to a technique called water agar. Now, water agar is just like making agar, um, and but it's going to look a little different. That right there is water agar. It is water and agar agar. That's it. Um, <clears throat> what that does is it robs uh, the substrate of pretty much any nutrients that you've got. It's actually one of the reasons why I use RO water in my water agar instead of tap. You can use tap though, tap works just fine. Um, I just thought, you know, remove even more nutrients away from it. Why that is, is that mycelium is able to grow very slowly, very anemically across that water agar. Bacteria can't transport food from its original food source to the ends. Yeast and bacteria have to, they replicate, they bud out another, you know, bloop, another one, bloop, 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 all the way like that, the whole way through. That means that they have to be able to eat where they lay. Uh, mycelium doesn't have that problem, mycelium can grow through. So, you've got bacteria, bloop, 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 right, growing, and then you have mycelium growing, bam. Now it's through that yeast, it's through that bacteria, and now I can take a sector from right here, right? That sector now is clean, though I'll want to test it a few times and grow it out a few dishes just to make really sh to make sure. But that water agar is how I have cleaned up uh, two or three cultures now, and I love it. I actually got that suggestion from Sydney Ober Singleton and Alan Rockefeller on the mushroom growing groups. So uh, those guys have given me really good advice before. Um, I have used antibiotics and made antibiotic agar. I don't like antibiotic agar. A lot of times what I'm dealing with uh, as a problematic thing is yeast, and yeast is a fungus. It is not as sensitive to uh, the antibiotic as bacteria is, and therefore you don't actually get much of a benefit from it. And you know, molds and yeasts are the two things that I've dealt with the most. Uh, just I don't know, antibiotic, uh, antibiotic agar has never really just worked well for me. If it's bacterial, bacteria is usually really easy to run from. I've never had any problems sectoring out from there, so I, I just, I would rather rely on technique than a chemo, uh, a, 
not a chemical agent, but uh, over a crutch like agar. Like I wouldn't make agar a part of my daily usage. So now uh, the second thing we want to talk about is slants, right? These culture slants that we made. And I actually ran out a little bit of my agar, so I've got like two or three of these left. But these are not great for work, right? For one thing, you got to get down in there and you got to work a little bit, and, and it's just, it's not great for cleanup work. There's not enough room for mycelium to grow out. Um, it's not really good for just growing up mass biomass. So, what I have found that these are most useful for, as most people seem to, to do, is for long term storage of cultures. I can store what? One culture, two, three, four, five. Right? Oh, that's about all I can handle. Five different strains, five different cultures in this space. Now, I could get away with more if I was willing to use a smaller um, tube, like a test tube or a smaller centrifuge tube, like uh, like this guy right here. You can see how much smaller this one is. Now. You can get away with you storing a lot more cultures with this than with that one. However, what I like about that one is the bigger one, the bigger one, I can actually angle my scalpel when I'm working. I can get in there, I can move things around, I'm more comfortable. I've got big fat, you know, big fat man hands. So it's easier for me to work if I can work in an environment that's, that's more... Uh, adaptable for me, you know, something where my clumsy fingers can get in, a little kinder to me. So, that's, that's kindness to myself. Now, what I typically do is take these and put five of them in a Ziploc baggie after they've been inoculated. Um, so, what, it, what I do is I inoculate them uh, in the flow hood, wrap this with parafilm. After that's been wrapped with parafilm and I start to see growth on this, I just leave it out in the room to grow. As it starts to grow out, great. Now I know it's clean. I make sure to inspect it for any bacteria, mold, anything else. If it looks clean and everything's good and it's growing out just fine, I then take that, store up to five of these tubes in a little uh, sandwich baggie, close it up, put it in a refrigerator. I've got uh, 25 different cultures stored in my home fridge upstairs right now with a lot more about to go into it from where I've been breeding all these new strains. So, it's a great way for long-term storage. They can stay in the fridge for a year, two years, more. I, I'm trying to get them where I've got a yearly rotation where I'm pulling that out, growing a little bit across the dish, taking that, putting it back in the tube, replacing every every uh, every long-term storage point for at least, you know, yearly. And it means that they're just getting a very few replications before they get put back into cold storage. And, you know, that's been, that's been working really well so far. I've got, you know, I'm hoping to run this out multiple years. Eventually, I'd like to be able to, you know, use liquid nitrogen to just flash freeze these things and have uh, incredibly long cold storage going. But you got to have money for that first. So, uh, that said, now, I think we can, we're ready to go upstairs and learn how to make our agar and learn how to set it up in our flasks and get everything... Uh, cooking so let's get to that shall we thanks for watching and make sure to check out our other videos